Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the chromatin and epigenetics session uh, for the, the fly meeting component. Um, I'm Gary Carpin. Uh, introduce co-chairs Amanda Laraquente and Anique Jansen. Uh, Sue Selmaker asked me to make an announcement, which is that in case you've run into issues, the posters are supposed to be open 24 hours a day. So if there's a problem, go to the registration desk and deal with it. Okay, so let's get started. Um, our first speaker is um, Sally Elgin, and um, she's going to talk about repetitious elements drive silencing in the Drosophila melanogaster genome through heterochromatin formation. Thank you. So, good morning to the faithful who made it here at 8 a.m. I'm impressed. Um, I'd like to start by uh, thanking my colleagues. Uh, virtually everyone here uh, contributed to this talk, uh, but this morning I'm going to be emphasizing work by Carmela Haynes, Michael Lee, and Elena Gracheva. As we all know, and I must say some nights I stay awake worrying about this, uh, our genomes uh, code for very few genes, uh, but have a very high density of repetitious elements, much of which is derived from transposable elements, some of which are uh, generally still active and could disrupt the genome. Other is simple satellite DNA. Uh, but the bottom line is that there's a lot of DNA in our genome that we would prefer to uh, have silent. Uh, and we know that that is accomplished uh, in significant part by packaging it into heterochromatin. Flies, of course, have been a wonderful vehicle for studying this silencing, a model organism at its best, uh, in that uh, we have a very ready assay uh, in position effect variegation uh, in which uh, a reporter, and I'll be using the white gene uh, throughout this talk, uh, is silenced in some of the cells in which it normally would be active, and that the silencing is a consequence of its uh, removal from a euchromatic domain uh, juxtaposed to a heterochromatic domain either by rearrangement or transposition. Now, during the last 20 years, we've learned a lot about the biochemistry of this event, and I particularly want to call your attention to the shift in the histone modification patterns from a state in which we see hyperacetylation of the histone tails to one where we have hypoacetylation of the histone tails, as well as the uh, well-known uh, modification of H3K9, uh, creating a methylated site that interacts with heterochromatin protein 1. Uh, there's uh, considerable evidence uh, that indeed this packaging is responsible for and contributes to silencing. Uh, and that's been brought home uh, as our understanding of uh, repeats has increased. So repeats, whether whole genes, and this was demonstrated in some of Hennikoff's experiments, the transposable elements, uh, which are a distributed repeat, or as simple as triplets, just three nucleotides repeated over and over, uh, appear to be recognized by the cell and serve as targets for heterochromatin formation. And that, of course, can have uh, deleterious effects. Uh, so, for example, uh, we now know that there is a group of human mutations uh, that uh, in, are, are represented as uh, repeat expansions and then serve as targets for local heterochromatin formation, resulting in loss of gene function. Uh, in particular, fragile X mutation, Friedrich's ataxia, and myotonic dystrophy. Okay, so that's the political commentary for this morning. <laughs> All right, so uh, our interest in um, looking at the repeat as targets for silencing started with the element 1360, uh, which uh, is a uh, uh, transposable element remnant, which we were able to identify in the fourth chromosome as a likely target for silencing. Uh, to test that proposition, uh, we set up uh, this P element uh, and put it back into the genome uh, with the cheerful hope that we could create instant heterochromatin anywhere in the genome. That turns out not to be the case. If you insert this out in the arms, you get full red expression of the reporter. But if it's inserted close to the paracentric heterochromatin, you can get uh, a very significant uh, silencing PEV phenotype. This phenotype is dependent not only on the location, but also on uh, the target. If we flip out the 1360 using these Fritz sites, uh, we revert to a much higher level of expression. Now with that, um, 
in mind, <clears throat> we set out to study the, the targeting phenomena in greater detail by creating this construct uh, based on uh, the work uh, from Ting Wu's lab, creating a, a landing pad construct. This means that once we've got this inserted at a site of interest, we can maintain it there and simply replace uh, the test sequence. Okay, and one of the lines that we recovered is inserted here within the NESD gene. Uh, this is a domain uh, that is in itself euchromatic. Uh, the gene is expressed at high levels in the early embryo, uh, but it's within about 10 kb of a block of repeats, which are packaged as uh, heterochromatin using uh, K9 methylation and HP1. Insertion of the reporter here results in a twofold loss of expression, uh, a weak variegating phenotype, which we nonetheless can demonstrate is dependent on the presence of 1360. If we flip out the 1360 again with FRIT, we revert to a full red eye, and we can demonstrate by CHIP that the presence of the 1360 leads to a higher occupancy by HP1. So this provides us with a system in which we can explore the impact uh, either of a modified 1360 or of other repeats. And what I want to show you this morning is the impact of other repeat arrays. Uh, so the first one we tested uh, was a LAC-O array. This was originally uh, cloned by Andy Belmont and has been used by uh, Lori Walrath and her colleagues. Um, Lori showed that when a reporter of this type is inserted out in the arms, you get a full red eye. You can obtain a down regulation by tethering HP1 to this site. Uh, using just this block of LAC-O and inserting it back into our landing uh, pad vector here, uh, what we see in the NESD site is a fairly dramatic uh, PEV phenotype, an eight-fold silencing, okay? Uh, and that silencing is dependent on the added LACO, as you can see, if you flip out uh, the LACO, uh, you lose silencing. This silencing turned out to be very peculiar. Uh, as we anticipated, uh, the silencing is dependent on HP1 and then SUBAR37, another protein that works with HP1 and heterochromatin formation. Uh, but uh, we were unable to demonstrate a dominant phenotype uh, using mutations in any of the three uh, known H3K9 methyltransferases, SUBAR39, AG, and G9A. This was a surprise. Uh, we therefore uh, looked uh, with CHIP to see uh, what we could determine about uh, the association of those proteins at the site. If we're looking at 1360 and we flip out the, um, the uh, rep repetitive element, we find uh, a striking loss in HP1 on removal of the element, a striking loss of H3K9 uh, dimethyl. On the, in contrast, for the LAC case, if we flip out LAC, we see a loss of HP1, but we don't see a significant change in the H3K9 uh, dimethyl. Uh, now, I'm not willing to say it's not there. We have significant signal. I think there is some of that modification present, but it's not changing in response to the uh, added uh, lack of O repeat. And then we got a second surprise. This was a very peculiar uh, phenotype, so uh, I sent off the flies to uh, my friend and colleague, Gunter Reuter. Uh, Gunter, as you, many of you know, has worked a long time in PEV, has a lot of different um, suppressors, uh, identified, uh, and he was going to cross this for me, and, and he wrote back and said, well, you know, we can do the crosses, but I don't think the phenotype's all that good, and I said, what, what? I've never seen a better phenotype. I'm looking at this, he's looking at this. Uh, a lot of palaver back and forth, and what we discovered was that this uh, line has a very strong temperature effect, and it's the inverse of what you normally expect for PEV. Normally, if we lower the temperature, we get increased silencing. Here, we've lowered the temperature, uh, and we've lost silencing. We do not understand this, but we're beginning to play with manipulation of temperature, and in doing so, we can begin to see some uh, dependency on SUVAR39. So there's a lot to be explored there. But some component that's maintaining the silencing uh, at this lack of repeat uh, is temperature sensitive. All right. Now, because uh, we were not seeing much in the H3K9 methylation response, uh, we naturally turned to look at acetylation. So remember, 
The second part of the switch in histone modifications is that deacetylation step. And Eric Selker's lab has shown that in Neurospora, he can tease apart these uh, two aspects of the silencing pathway. Uh, so we looked uh, initially by looking at the impact of mutations in SYN3A, uh, and we do indeed see a loss of silencing. Uh, Michael followed up with an RNAi-based screen of the 10 different histone deacetylases that are known. Uh, he found an impact in mutations in HDA, uh, HDAC6 and HDACX. Not RP3D, somewhat to my surprise. This is a prominent partner of SYN3A. And he also saw an impact uh, with um, uh, so the uh, SIR2 uh, HDAC. Uh, so we have started to do some feeding experiments as well. Nicotinamide, this is vitamin B3, in case any of you are interested in uh, maintaining your balance and silencing. Um, vitamin uh, B3 is an HDAC inhibitor, uh, and too much of it will result in a loss of silencing. We've put this in the food uh, and shown that with various variegating phenotypes, uh, we can see a dosage response curve, and we can see a loss of silencing. So we're moving forward uh, in this case with the thought uh, that regulation of the histone uh, acetylation state may be a key part of the mechanism, and it seems to have distinct features relative to heterochromatin formation as we've seen it before. Now, the, the, the last repeat I'd like to talk about uh, is the triplet repeat. And for this work, we teamed up with Richard Festenstein. He and his colleagues have shown in mammalian cells uh, that if you use a cell surface marker uh, as your reporter, and this allows him to count affected cells just by doing flow sort, uh, if this marker is placed adjacent to heterochromatin, uh, he gets a variegating phenotype, uh, but the same marker out in the arms, if adjacent to a triplet repeat, uh, provides a, a variegating phenotype. Uh, Richard sent us this fragment of DNA, the GAA uh, repeat, um, from a Friedrichs ataxia patient. And when we insert that into our favorite site here, I think, again, we get a very robust silencing phenotype. So these triplet repeat sequences inserted uh, at an appropriate site in the fly can drive silencing. Now, in this case, uh, we are seeing a, a classical phenotype uh, in the sense that we see um, uh, sensitivity to dominant mutations in SUBAR39, the H3K9 histone methyltransferase, HP1, and uh, SYN3A. So in this case, we think both the uh, H3K9 methylation and the um, uh, H3K9, uh, which one did I say? Anyway, both acetylation and methylation are, are operative in this case. Okay. So, final slide. How about that? I'm ahead of time. Uh, think, think questions, guys. Um, <laughs> so, summing up uh, what I've told you this morning uh, is uh, that we have found that in flies, repeat induced silencing is dependent on genome context. And this suggests to us a requirement for uh, a two step mechanism, if as you will, uh, for targeting and spreading. Uh, that we uh, have a system within flies to recognize repeats, to target them for silencing, uh, and that silencing is facilitated by uh, proximity to a heterochromatin mass uh, and uh, suggests that spreading from that mass can facilitate uh, establishing a silencing um, chromatin configuration. We've shown that foreign repeats can induce robust silencing uh, at our target site, 1198, now, of course, when I say that, we are simply uh, checking uh, the LAC O repeat and the triplet repeat against the posted Drosophila genome, which, as you all know, while it's greatly improved due to heroic efforts uh, by uh, Carpen and Selnicker and others, still is not the complete genome. Uh, and we're doing this just on a bioinformatics basis. But on that basis, uh, we would say that these repeats uh, are novel to Drosophila. They've never been seen before. There's nothing in the repertoire that would lead to their identification other than the fact that they're repeats. Okay, uh, we do see that the triplet repeat, uh, GAA310, from a Friedrichs ataxia patient, uh, mimics typical heterochromatin formation, uh, and that, uh, I think, provides some opportunities for follow-up studies. And most particular, 
What I love about this uh, set of, of experiments is uh, the uh, strength of the silencing phenotypes, both for the LACO repeats and for the triplet repeat. We've got robust silencing, and that positions us to do a forward screen to see if we can actually identify factors uh, beyond those that are associated with the uh, silencing paracentric heterochromatin uh, that we are familiar with, and Gunther's got a lot of, of SUBARs uh, for those phenotypes. Uh, the goal for the next year will be to see if we can identify through a forward screen factors uh, above and beyond uh, th those uh, that are required for the recognition and silencing of repeats. Thank you very much. Sue. So um, in worms, we also have a temperature sensitive derepression of repeats under certain conditions, and it seems to correlate in our hands uh, with transcription through the repeat. So have you looked at RNA-seq, and do you ever see uh, the GAA or the LACO being transcribed uh, by an RNA-seq or by something like that? Well, only if I get my slides back. Um, can we uh, reactivate that set of slides? We're not through talking about them. Any chance? What am I supposed to do? What's that? OK. Thank you. Okay, um, you will notice uh, that the insertion site 1198 actually lies within the NE NESD gene, uh, and that gene is transcribed uh, at significant levels uh, throughout early embryogenesis. We've shown in the case of the 1360 repeat uh, that we are getting read-through transcription. And in fact, I didn't have time to discuss it, but <clears throat> our evidence suggests to us that in the case of 1360, which is uh, part <clears throat> of the established repertoire of transposable element uh, remnants. 1360 is found in pi RNA populations, uh, and uh, we have shown that its silencing at this position is dependent on fragments within 1360 that match to chart fragments that are in the pi RNA population uh, and are the appropriate strands so that once you get transcription through 1360, starting from the NESD promoter, uh, you will indeed have an RNA strand that could reasonably uh, form uh, double-stranded RNA and enter into RNA processing. This silencing is sensitive to mutations and Pee-wee and Aubergine. So in the instance of the transposable elements where the organism has a well-established repertoire, it knows what these sequences look like, it's got uh, mechanisms established to beat them down. Uh, we think uh, that transcription is probably actually key. Um, this results in, in my favorite uh, hypothesis for silencing transposable elements, which we call the whack-a-mole hypothesis. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping you're all familiar with the arcade game where you know, the little critter pops up and you have to whack him down. Um, we uh, would put forward the idea that transcription, in fact, is part of that recognition mechanism. It's what gives you your RNA-RNA duplex for the IRNA, pi RNA system. Uh, and it's deliberately designed to whack down any of the uh, transposable elements who poke their head up by getting transcribed. Uh, and uh, we think that PEV is a very sensitive assay of that. We have not gotten to the stage uh, of our work on either the LACO repeat or the uh, triplet repeat uh, to uh, de definitively demonstrate that they are being transcribed. We suspect they are being transcribed by read-through from uh, the um, NESD gene, but we just haven't gotten that far. Right, sorry, <clears throat> go. Thanks so much, Sally. And